everyone, it's Katie McKelvin, the director of Louisiana Fosters, and I have with us today Dr. Mark Johnson. Yeah, he is the you. senior pastor at Edgewater Baptist Church and a professor at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Listen, thank you guys for having us. I'm really excited about sharing today. So yeah, fantastic. To okay, yeah. let's talk about what your background is and how it drew you to this kind of work. Yeah, you know, it's amazing when I think about, uh, I guess I have to start with my father and grandfather. Mm -hmm. You know, they're both pastors in ministry. And so as a kid, I used to follow them everywhere. I used to go to, when they went to the prison ministry, they did that. Went to homeless ministry, we did that. Wow. When we went to all these different places, we did that. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I would just sneak in and try to figure out exactly how things look as a, as a minister from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into this work, you know, in pastoring, it just, you know, I've been in it 25 years. So this is my 25th year in ministry. Wow. So I've pastored a number of churches uh, in Cleveland, in New Jersey, and now here in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And there's been some common themes that stay true People need support and love. You know, yeah. when you look at it, that's really where it all comes down to. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself in those moments just kind of following their footsteps, following their shoes. And then before I know it, now I'm standing in them, which is crazy to think about. Because when yeah. I hear Dr. Mark, you just said Dr. Mark Johnson. <laughs> I'm looking for my dad. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm getting used to this whole idea of being in his shoes. So it's been a, an amazing journey so far. Oh, wow. So, yeah. it, you know, it started off with your family. Started off with family. Wow. Started off with family. It was a good um, thing there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about your history. Yeah with um, with basketball. Yeah, I know. It found me. You know what I mean? That kind of, I guess as a kid you grow up and I'm six foot six right now. So uh, basketball is just, I was like, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but you know, the amazing thing is, let me tell you a quick story. So I went out for my high school team and I have a twin brother. His name is Matthew Johnson, straight from the Bible, Matthew and Mark, all right? Love and it. so we both go out for the team. He makes it, I don't make it. Oh. And so my life is wrecked. So oh. I spent a year being his statistician and just doing all the dirty work, carrying the balls and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. So the following year, we have another trial. We both make the team this year, and I vowed never to ever feel that again. And I guess that kind of compelled me to go into eventually to pro-level basketball. Wow. So I went to college and then end up going to pro as well. So it was just an amazing journey of watching how all these things come to play. And then I take basketball and piece it together with ministry. So I struggled in a little bit uh, when I went to college at Washington and Jefferson College. Then I went to Princeton Theological Seminary, spent a lot of time on the East Coast. Um, so I'm uh, at Princeton and I'm going to do work in a ministry in urban Newark, New Jersey. So mm. I'm in Ivy League to the hood, Ivy right. League to the hood. <laughs> and what's the common, how do you bridge that gap you right. know, between that? And basketball was that bridge. So eventually they saw that there was this guy from Princeton. He was a minister. Who is this guy? So I got Crips and Bloods all around me. We're wow. all playing together. And then I go up and dunk on somebody and they say, wait a minute, I didn't know pastors can dunk, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so that formed a relationship. And then from there, you build that credibility with people. And, and throughout ministry, it's been that way throughout, the, throughout my whole time in ministry. So it's been pretty cool. Yes. Yeah, so, and we talk a lot about yeah. um, using what you have. Yeah, you know, yeah, we, we yeah. don't ha we're not asking people to recreate the will. And this has been such a theme yeah, in our yeah. conversations. And that seems like what you did. You just used what yeah. God blessed you with to yeah. connect with um, the community around you. Absolutely. And that's yeah. been our mainstay. And I think when I think about foster care agencies, because pr pretty much if you're a, a, a coach or a basketball player in any way, you're going to come across some foster kids yeah. somehow, some way, because you're coaching them and you're reaching out to them. So there's so many different ways people can touch the foster care community. Right. Uh, just be naturally you, whoever mm. you are naturally mm. that comes across. And it always cross pollinates with other agencies and things like that as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, yeah. awesome. Absolutely. So how do you get mm -hmm. um, a congregation involved in foster care? You know, it's the weirdest thing because I say this in, in, to our churches, particularly in New Jersey and Cleveland and now here in Louisiana, uh, changing a life will change your life. Mm -hmm. Like in everything that you do, when you go to change someone's life, your life will automatically be changed. And so that's been the initial key for us. We've had people on the fence at our church. I think one of the, the knocks on African-American churches is that they're not as involved with foster care as they should be. Mm. And I've wrestled with that for years, did some studies, looked at it. And I think it's because African-American churches are automatically foster care agencies. Mm. Uh, we spend time taking care of uncle's kids and friends yeah. in the neighborhood and gathering people together. But I'm finding out that there is an intrigue now. I'm, I'm starting to sense that there's a turn a little bit where you can allow people to look over the shoulder of someone who's already providing foster care. And that's what churches do. We find ways to support individuals in our church 
who's doing foster care, uh, foster care providing foster care. Mm -hmm. And so we don't look at it as just a moment, we look at it as a movement, something where we can all come together and see how we can support. So anyone interested, they can look over the shoulder and get a taste of what it's like, and then before you know it, they're involved as well. So it's been that kind of step-by-step -step with our church where right. we're intentionally sharing the message so that people can, can connect in. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so just making sure they, they hear it. Yeah, yeah, that has to be a part of it. I don't think um, in a lot of ways, uh, just like Christmas comes and goes. Thanksgiving comes mm -hmm. and goes. It's, the, it's a hit. Foster care shouldn't be a special day. It should be mm -hmm. a part of the entire uh, church. What I found out with the individuals, particularly Shelby and Justin, who's a part of foster caring in our church, is that it's, it's something that's just a part of their everyday life. You right. know? And in our church, it's, it's a part of our prayers. It's a, the pastors speak it over the pulpit. Mm. It's a part of our uh, everyday activities in our small groups. And it's not something that's just something. Here's an announcement. It's really something that has to be the fiber of a church. Mm. And if that's the case, what happens to a foster care student? If we think about your kids, our kids, if we think about our kids, we're not looking at them as a moment. We're thinking about the course of their lives mm -hmm. and the impact that people have along the way. Right. So you have coaches who have an impact, teachers who have an mm -hmm. impact, and we may not see the kind of impact that takes place as a result of them being involved in foster care, but if they just take a moment, we could literally change a person, then a family, then a church, then a neighborhood, then a city, then a state, than a world. If everyone would grab hold of a child and not see them as someone who has a problem I have to fix, mm. but see them as a possible, the possible person that could hold the cure to cancer, the possible person. Yeah. How do you treat someone when they're, more, they're bigger than a problem? And mm. then for foster care, it's more like taking a child and changing a community by loving on a person. And so that's what we try to accomplish. And yeah. as a result of that, people grow uh, and they experience life of fullness in themselves mm -hmm. that, that's uh, played out in the life of their foster care journey. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's, um, yeah. So when we talk about the service side of mm -hmm. this in your congregation, can Absolutely. you talk to that a little bit about um, what that looks like for you and yeah. maybe for your congregation as well? Yeah, I had a, a group of people. Kevin Litchfield is, is a family uh, that went through it. So I'll give you a, a, just a play-by-play. -play. So Kevin Litchfield had a, a foster care family that he was supporting, uh, those kind of things. And an agency said that we're going to provide Christmas toys for the kids. Right. Well, something falls through and that does not happen. So when that happens, how can the church support? You know, mm. we do. We go get toys. That's right. what we do. Everybody gets toys, get hats, get everything we can. Right. And we spoil the heck out of all these kids and make sure that they know that there's a bigger community that's surrounding this family. It's right. not just you and your own. And I mm. think that's been helpful in allowing people to be more comfortable with uh, participating in foster care because they know that there's a group of people who are around them who love them, who wants to challenge and push them. Uh, so we pick up the place, the places where everybody else leaves off and we're saying, no, we're here as a part of the fabric. And I think that's what a church is supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to be, we're a fa extended family community that comes together and make a difference. And the church does that in, in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. but I don't think it, it, it's as strong as it could be in the foster care area. Right. And I think if that grabs hold, then, it, then some of the situations just change automatically. So yeah, and I think that's the, mm -hmm. the one of the fibers of Louisiana Fosters is yeah. to promote that with church leaders. Absolutely, you know, because it's one thing to get your congregation involved, but if you believe it as a church yeah. um, leader, yeah. then your congregation will follow suit. And so that's mm -hmm. the um, the mission of One Church, One Family, One Child in Louisiana mm -hmm. Fosters. I said it's a. I talked a little bit just now about the mm -hmm. role of the um, pastor in the church. Tell me um, mm -hmm. your perception on that. Like the, yeah. what is the role the pastor can play in this? Yeah, they, if the pastor goes, sticks his head in anything, I mean, it's just going to take off as soon as they have passion right. about it. Just think about families. You know, if mom's in, everybody else is in no matter <laughs> right? what. Right. So I do think uh, leadership has a big key, but I never underestimate just there's a pulpit and there's a pew and I don't underestimate the power of the pew to impact the pulpit mm. because oftentimes we think about it in reverse the pulpit impacts the pew and we understand the dynamics of what that is mm -hmm. but man I'm telling you I was a youth pastor before becoming a senior pastor right mm -hmm. and there were some things that the kids wanted to do that I as the, the youth leader didn't want to do and they pouted and they complained and they folded their arms and they were wagging their heads <laughs> at me and said we're not doing anything else you want to do if you don't do these list of demands that we have for you to do. 
Man, and so we went on camping trips. We did all this stuff that I did not think they would respond to, all because they had the energy. And so there's something about the pew that grabs hold of this thing, brings it to the pastor, and drives him crazy until he gets on board. And once uh, I do think that that's a huge part of it as well. However, when the pastor is involved, then changes can happen. But I never underestimate the power of the pew to make a difference in the pulpit as well. It's all about everybody working. It's everybody. We're all this thing together. We're in it together. You're right. So where do you hope to take things in the future? You know what? I was thinking about this. and I, after, I, I talked to people who really are in the trenches. Like those, there's a supporting group of people. There's people who's preparing, but the people in the trenches. Where are we trying to take this as we think about foster care agency and people? That it just becomes a natural con- conversation. I'm hoping it hits a nerve. I'm hoping that people see that there's a need to be addressed, but not just to fix a kid or to fix a family, but in fixing this child and, and helping this family, it has an impact on all of us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the difference when I think about foster caring. I think that it's more than just, there's a problem there and I have to fix it. Right. I think there's, an ish, there's a bigger problem outside of it that may be fixed by loving on this family. Mm-hmm. And once that family gets up on their feet and able to do some of the things that they couldn't do before, then as a result, we put a member in society who is radically changed with love And if you get a person who's radically changed with love, they change with love, and then the society changes with love. And so it starts with an act of love that goes into a person. Now they have that act of love that activates them to do what they're called to do. And then now people on the outside can see it all started because someone extended a hand of love. So you're not just grabbing a person and bringing them into your home. You're not just going through a system. You're imparting a love component that may be missing or need to be developed and you're taking that situation and letting it explode out. And then mm. before you know it, you got love sprinkles everywhere. That was real corny. I'm sorry. I no, said. but I love that. <laughs> I said love sprinkles. Who said love sprinkles? Are you doing? I love it. <laughs> love sprinkles everywhere. I just love that. No. <laughs> but I it's just... a part of it. It's, it really is a part of it. And, I, and I've seen it. I've seen it uh, with individuals. And I, and I take this, uh, man, I keep thinking about this kid, Caleb. And then there's another uh, a young lady. I cannot remember her name. But these individuals who came in really apprehensive, nervous, uh, kind of, you know, looking around, making sure, is this real? Mm-hmm. Like, like pe- one thing I say about young people is they can smell real. They can. If they can't smell anything else, they can smell real. So my job is to make sure the person going into this scenario, particularly if you are going to consider being a foster care person, you got to be real. Yeah. And so there, I need to see a trail. And I think this is where the how you start to develop a, a, some kind of pipeline where you can kind of say, I, don't want ev- I do not want everyone being a foster care parent. I, I'm sorry, I just don't. I need the kind of people who can affect radical change. Here's right. why. If we get the right person to represent what foster caring really looks like at its genuine level, mm. then you'll start to inspire people to want to consider doing it as well. Right. If you have someone who's corny, I'm sorry for saying that word again, corny and not real about it, they won't affect anyone because we're trying to hit people at the heart level, not yeah. just the head level. In order to reach the heart level, they gotta be real, and that realness comes off and other people sees that, sees that and they wanna be a part of it, uh, but they don't wanna be a phony. So we're looking mm-hmm. for real people who's about real change and can see beyond either a paycheck or something to do or you have nothing else going on in your life. No, I need the people who are really going to make a sacrifice to do foster care. Mm. Those are the people who are willing to say, I got a lot going on, but I I just feel compelled to do this. They inspire other people to do it as well. And if the churches can start developing those people, then we'll see a huge difference in the foster care numbers and those statistics. So it'll be pretty cool to see. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So yep. I usually ask at the end of these, but I feel like you answered it. Um, but you can, if you have a different answer, yeah, you're yeah, more yeah. than welcome. Mm-hmm. If there were no boundaries yeah. and no money mm-hmm. involved, um, and you can do whatever you want in this arena, hmm. what would what would you do? I would probably. Uh, I have my wife put in a sane asylum because she would be nervous about what I would do. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Listen, listen, I'm the kind of guy. Listen, I had a church. I, I was pastoring a church in Cleveland, Ohio. We had about 80 kids that had nothing to do on Sunday from like 3.30 to about 6. I come up with this crazy idea. I walk into a school and say, can I have your school from 3.30 to 6? They give it to me. Oh, my goodness. Who does that? They said, yeah, okay. So, so I grab all these kids from the neighborhood. We go, I, I called it Encouraged Church because I couldn't think of another way to call it. I said, uh, this is called Encouraged Church where we encourage you. 
uh, throughout this day. And so we roll out basketballs, and I had about 80 guys from the community, 80 young men from the ages of third grade all the way up to about 28 years old. They were in the gym playing with me, just basketball, right? So we had that going on, and then what happens? They bring their girlfriends. Now we got from 80 to that number, their girlfriends come in. So now we gotta figure out what to do with their girlfriends. So my <laughs> wife takes the girlfriends, and you know, if they have boyfriend and girlfriends, I know I would rather have them married, but they're not. In some cases, they have children. So now we have 80 guys playing basketball on Sundays from three to about six. Then you have their girlfriends who come in and they do faint face painting and everything with my wife and her crew upstairs in the offices of the uh, of this school. And then we have their kids who come in as well. So we're trying to find things for them to do. So if I had a witness, it would be a, like everybody, like a city. Be, watch <laughs> this. The city becomes the home. Love that. Like the city, Gosh, the whole so city. Good becomes just the home. If we could find a way in every home, you got your play area, your living area, your kitchen area, your, all these different things. What happens when a whole city becomes a home? Mm -hmm. So now foster care is not you coming into our home, it's you coming into our city. Mm -hmm. And if you come into our city, now we have their, 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 their components all over the place. So foster care agency is not about you coming to a house, you coming into our city. And if we infect the city, we affect the county. If we affect the county, we affect the state. And then before you know it, you have a whole state that's foster care, a foster care state, yeah. a foster care county, a foster care city, all because one family said yes. We take those components and make it bigger. Take that component and make it bigger. So if I had no worries with money at all, that's what I would do. I would create a foster care state. That's a f that is, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> it's scary, I know. No, I my brain thinks like that. I drive my wife crazy all the time. She says, "Please stop. Go to sleep. Do something else." She probably <laughs> when you say something like, "I have an idea," she's like, <laughs> <laughs> "Hey, we've been married 25 years. I've been driving her crazy. We've been all over the city. I mean, I'm, we've moved in certain different areas. We lived in Augsburg, Germany, over to New Orleans, to uh, New Jersey, Ohio, Cleveland, Indiana. So." It's really following your heart. And what is it that makes your heart beat? When your heart stops beating, stop doing it because you're going to die. Mm, Find true. out what makes your heart beat and keep doing that over and over again. And before you know it, your effect, your effect change everywhere. So, wow. sorry. No. That's so My wife told me to behave. She said, don't you go there and embarrass me. So. No, this is what we <laughs> want. Because the whole idea behind yeah. these videos are to inspire people yeah, to think bigger than right here. Yeah, I, mean, they, yeah. they, I think we're so worried about absolutely. what happens right here that we don't realize that we, we yeah. were created yeah. to be more and to do more. Absolutely. And that's what we want to see. We want to, yeah. we want people to, to get in front of an audience and say, you can do this. Yeah, you can be this. You just have to think past right here yeah, you know and I right. think that I love that I yeah, love yeah. Um, your enthusiasm and your passion it's for it insane. Just, trust me you I'm good for like a half hour but after 45 minutes you're like get him out of here <laughs> 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 well thank you so much for thank being you here guys with us. for having me we're proud of you guys thanks for all you're doing um, oh. like fosters we look forward to what God has in store for you all and keep pushing because it gets weird you get you get it gets lonely sometimes yeah. when you're pushing there you get worn down but stay on the path you know, it'll, it'll unfold it exactly what you need so thanks so much for having me appreciate right, it thank you thank you hey thank you guys appreciate it.